audio and visual trouble. I think we've got it worked out now. We're ready to start. Mary, why don't you start us out? Okay, I'll be happy to. Um, again, we'd like to wish everyone a good day. My name is Mary Bracken, and I'm with Raptivity, who's actually the sponsor of this webinar today. And I'm going to be proudly introducing Brian Chapman, who's a thought leader in the e-learning industry. And Brian, some of his qualifications, as I'm sure you're familiar with, that he's the chief learning strategist at Chapman Alliance, LLC which is a provider of research-centric consulting services. And their purpose is to assist organizations that define, operate, and optimize strategic learning initiatives. And really, he's a veteran in the industry with over 20 years of experience. And Brian, just to name a few, has worked with such organizations as American Express, Kodak, Shell, Sprint, Sharp Electronics, Honda, IBM, Avon, UNICEF, the FDA, State Department, and many, many others. And the purpose of his assistance is really to help them, and of course all of us through today's webinar, optimize learning efficiency through the use of innovative learning techniques and technologies. And then also Brian was formerly the Director of Research and Strategy for independent research and consulting firm Brandon Hall Research. And what he did there, he served as the primary author and researcher on high-profile products, projects such as LMS Knowledge Base, LCMS Comparative Analysis Report, and then the comparison of simulation products and services. And so again, we all recognize Brian as a thought leader, and now Raptivity is happy to turn this webinar over to Brian. Hi, everybody. Welcome and glad you could be here today. Um, I am really excited to do this session, primarily because this topic is one is very close to my heart. This is uh, something that I have been uh, personally, I have uh, been working in the technology-based learning arena for over 20 years, going clear back to uh, uh, days when we only had four colors on the monitor, all the way through uh, the early days of CD-ROM and now where we are today. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here. Let me do a couple of housekeeping things before we introduce the topic. There are three things we need you to know. One is, if you can't see my screen, full screen, you'd like it larger what you're, with what you're doing, you can go up on your control panel, and there's a, a menu called View. You just click on View and change the display to full screen, because the settings will be different on, on each machine. So if you, if you want to see it full screen, you can just change that to view of, Viewing Full Screen. The next thing is the way that you're primarily going to interact with us today is through the question and answer panel. Now, when it comes up, you, you have three boxes over on the side of your screen. One of them is labeled as question and answer. And there's a small arrow caret next to it that uh, if it's not pointing down, go ahead and click on that little arrow and we'll open up the question and answer panel. Now, it is going to cover a little bit of the PowerPoint slides, so you, there's a way to hide that for a moment. But when we get ready to ask you some questions, we want you to, we're going to actually have you answer through the question and answer uh, window pane. Now, uh, and then also you can, throughout the session, if you have a question about anything we're talking about, you can go ahead and enter it in the question and answer se section as well. And we will uh, address those during the audio question and answer period at the end of the session. Now, if the panel is covering some of the screen that you'd like to see, there's also uh, uh, three black arrows that point to the right that you can, you can close your control panel and open it at any time. And if you want to try that now, it won't throw you out of the presentation. You just say close control panel, three little black arrows, and it pushes the panel off to the side. You click them again, and it brings them back up. So again, the three main things is you can go to full screen, you can ask us questions through the question and answer panel, and you can also hide that control panel. So with that said, let's introduce today's topic. It's something, again, that's really close to my heart because uh, through my years of working in the instructional, uh, doing instructional design work and, and actually uh, working uh, on real projects uh, before I came a con became a consultant and now consult at the strategic level, uh, this was very close to me. Uh, you know, I have in the past I've created simulation engines that were used to create uh, hundreds of hours of, of free play simulations, and so I'm, uh, interactivity is very important from from my perspective as an instructional designer. Also, some of you may remember a product called Designer's Edge that was created back in the mid mid 90s. One of my tasks I, I developed that product uh, with through Allen Communication, but one of my tasks was to develop a whole set of instructional design templates. So I really appreciated it when Raptivity called and asked if I would speak for one of their sessions, 
because I, I have been there. I've created instructional design templates. I know how difficult it is, and I very much admire what they've done. But the session today is, even though sponsored by Raptivity, we want to talk about rapid development in general and how to keep interactivity as part of that and how to use the right authoring tools at the right time. The other thing that, I use, uh, that I've done quite extensively is at many of the conferences, I've taught hands-on workshops on how to create interactivity in courseware. And I have done that through, um, uh, I have done that, uh, we, what we would actually do is take a CD-ROM and install eight different applications on, on computer labs or through people bringing their own laptops. We would have them create things like drag and drop exercises and cutaways of, of, uh, of uh, te technical objects so learners could get inside and learn things. We created game formats. And so what we're going to do, uh, from what I see, this webinar is a lot like that, only we're going to do it today live with everyone here. Well, you know, because we want to keep this very interactive, we're going to start with a game. So let's, uh, on the webinar, it's actually going to be a game format. Here, I'm going to let you listen to the music for just a second. Okay, some of you might be familiar with the game Family Feud. Well, we're going to start and play a game called Rapid Development Feud. So if you would, open your question and answer panel by clicking the little down arrow next to it. Get ready to answer because we're going to see who, which, which you guys come up with the right answer for this one. Okay, now some of you may or, you may, or may not be familiar with the uh, game, the, the, the format Family Feud, but uh, it's based on uh, multiple answers in a survey format. So I know it's coming, the display is still coming up for some of you. We have the top seven answers on the board. Now, I'm going to introduce the question, and what I want you to do in the question and answer panel is type what you think the answer is. So we're going to see a whole bunch of questions pop in here in just a moment, and we'll to let you know if you're, if you're right. We're going to see who's going to get the right answers here. And I'll, I'll, I'll call you out by name if you get a right answer. And some of you may answer the same thing, so that's okay too. Okay, here's the question, very simply. Name the most common reason someone might not use interactivity during rapid development. Okay, go ahead and start putting them in the question and answers. All right, let's start seeing some of these come up here. I'm watching. All right. Okay, all right, Richard Linton, you got number one. All right, very good. Whoops, hang on. No, I accidentally showed the answers there. Let me back up just a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Number one answer is cost. Okay. Uh, number two, Douglas Miller. You got the right answer there. The answer is too much time. Okay. You're hitting on all the right answers. You guys are doing really good. You're going right down the board, which is amazing. Um, okay, somebody said uh, uh, boring. Uh, I'll have to give a buzz on that one. <laughs> Speed to market, uh, Cindy Garofalo. Um, I think that probably falls under too much time. Let's see if we can get some of those other answers. Keep typing. Okay, somebody said too hard. I'm going to give you that one. Here's the real. Here was the answer that we we got from our our audience. Here is it's a steep learning curve, big time. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Uh, again, I know a lot of you are typing answers in here. I'm trying to use the system to see if I can get to the answers a little better. All right, I'm looking down. A lot of you said time and cost. Richard Linton was the first one to get that. Let's see. Takes too much time. Too complex to create. Jesse Kramer, good job. Uh, let's see. Laziness, lack of uh, technical knowledge. Good answers. Uh, let's find out. Too expensive. Time constraints. You guys are hitting on the main three very much so. Too hard. Uh, cost and time. We're not getting some of the ones down below. Somebody said low bandwidth. That's a good good uh, possibility, but didn't make our survey. All right. Uh, boy, you guys got some good answers here. A lot, again, a lot of them around cost and time, and that's absolutely right. All right, well, we don't want to take too much time with this. Let me give you some of the other ones down below. I'm going to give you answer number four. Um, and nobody, I didn't see anybody say this one, but it could be there because there were lots of answers coming in. We've got uh, over uh, almost 300 people online with us here, so uh, quite, quite a few answers. Hard to integrate. And I think somebody, uh, somebody kind of alluded to this one. Why should I? In other words, what's the point? Do I really need interactivity? Is it, how important really is it? Yeah. And then an interesting one that came in on the survey, it's not in PowerPoint. So, um, you know, that, that's number six answer. You're seeing these pop up on the screen. I'm uh, putting them in right now. And the last one is lack of creativity. 
Okay. Now I want you to look at that screen for just a minute, uh, the answers that are, that are appearing there. And um, think about that for a moment, because this really is our problem space. This is what we're talking about today. Why don't, we, why don't people use interactivity in their rapid development? It, because it costs too much. And that number two defies all, all uh, you know, it defies the purpose of rapid development. It takes too much time. Because if, it were, if I were creating everything as being, being very interactive, it would take a ton of time, and therefore it's not rapid development anymore. So again, I'm not going to read through each of these, but I think you see the, this is the problem space. And what, what I, the point I wanted to make with this is that rapid development has become a trade-off for excluding interactivity. And my point and purpose in being here, if you leave this webinar with one central message, is that it shouldn't be. That is not what, uh, you know, that's uh, is, is a, it's a kind of a cop-out excuse. Okay, now with that said, let's, uh, let's uh, take a look here. And you can uh, type in your answers, but um, I, I, I use these slides quite a bit. Some of you may have seen them before, but I think it's important. It's very important to the discussion. How long does it take to create one hour of classroom instruction, teacher in front of the classroom? And I see a few of you have typed in on the question answer field, very close answers. Some said 40. Somebody said 15. All right. Well, the actual answer, and it's coming up for everyone now, it's uh, 34 hours. According to Training Magazine, that's the length of time it takes for, um, uh, uh, for, to create one finished hour of classroom instruction. So let's go to the next one then. So then uh, how long does it take to create one hour of e-learning? Okay, good to see some good answers here. Anything from well, 50, 175, 200, uh, a little bit higher, we'll bid up a bit. Uh, the correct answer, according to several audience surveys, is that it takes uh, 221 hours for every finished hour of, uh, of, uh, of courseware. That's, now, by the way, somebody asked a question in the, in the question and answer panel saying, is that just the time it takes to actually combine the text and graphics on screen? Or are we talking about something else here? And we're actually talking about the full range of rapid development. Uh, from, I'm, I'm sorry, of, of not just rapid development, but standard e-learning development from front-end analysis through the design process, actually creating design documents, storyboards, scripts, uh, creating content, uh, and even uh, the time it takes to quality test it and all of that sort of thing. Okay, so now um, next question. Uh, how long does it take to create one hour of simulation-based learning. Okay, that's going to be a little bit more. And again, this is where we start to see the fallout on rapid development. And a lot of people would, would argue that simulation is, is not an area uh, that you would, uh, uh, you know, that that's, this is, it is not, simulation is outside the boundaries or the scope of rapid development. I'm going to put up the time here because it takes a while to load on your screens, but um, uh, you know, the, an the correct answer uh, is 750 to 1. I was seeing people typing in ranges through the question and answer panel anywhere from, uh, you know, uh, 100 to 200 hours up to over 1,500 hours. And so uh, having developed, uh, again, a simulation engine that was used to, to create simulations with millions of paths, uh, I understand completely, uh, you know, it, 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 it is a very time-intensive and costly uh, uh, activity. Okay, well, with that said, oh, let's do one more here. And by the way, I noticed that our, our person, uh, as this, screen, this next screen loads for you, the question we're going to ask is, how long does it take to create one hour of PowerPoint-based online learning? Now, I've got a picture on the screen, and I noticed that he's uh, joined us in the, in the session here. It's Peter Rice from uh, Adobe. And so welcome, Peter. Uh, but uh, uh, he, his face is showing there on the screen. We, we tested this the theory by having a, a shootout where companies took power, a PowerPoint presentation that we created and converted it to online learning in very, very short amounts of time. But we asked the industry at large how long it takes, and we came up with the answer of about 33 hours, which is very interesting because it takes one less hour to create, um, uh, to create uh, uh, PowerPoint learning to, that it does to create instructor-led training, which I still haven't been able to figure that one out, but we didn't try to change the numbers. So, okay, so we, of, of all of these methods, which one is rapid development? Is it the th 
221 hours to one, standard e-learning? No, that's, that's really not considered rapid development. Simulation-based learning? Oh, that's too, too uh, long and intensive to be rapid development. What about 33 hours? Absolutely falls in that zone. Uh, yet, at the same time, once PowerPoint e-learning is produced, often what sacrifi what's sacrificed most often is the interactivity. I want to uh, give a case in point to this by telling a, a quick story. This, uh, this is something that occurred a few years back. Um, this is before I started holding uh, shoot, uh, refereeing shootout events myself. Uh, I was involved as a participant, as one of the members of the team. So, uh, so I've been on both sides, both the refereeing side and the development side. And I participated in the PC Week shootout uh, to create online learning. Now, this, this uh, uh, is a very, I think this story illustrates exactly what we're talking about. There were 12 teams invited to come to the University of Wisconsin, and the goal was to um, can take a 54-hour instructor-led course and convert it to online learning. Okay, now if that's not hard enough, uh, there's the, you know, the big uh, telltale sign here, is how long did we have to develop? Two days. Okay, now you just heard all the hours. So if we're talking about rapid development, this, this really is it. Now it got even worse than that. We could only have one person on the computer at any given time. So very difficult uh, challenge. Now, that be, well, before we went to the competition, they told us ahead of time, you, you, we're going to give you, uh, when you get on site, we're going to give you a storyboard. And this, you know, so we, we're really excited. We're thinking, okay, so all we really have to do is open the storyboard, use our authoring tool that we were bringing uh, into the competition, and start creating content as rapidly as possible. Well, guess what? Instead of giving us a storyboard, they ended up give, giving us a lesson plan, okay, something typically that an instructor would take into a classroom and start to, uh, you know, and use as narrative and, and you know, everything that happens in the you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you've seen lesson plans. They don't have a direct one-to-one -one translation into an e-learning course. But that, you know what, it made the competition much more interesting because what happened is this. Um, each of the, okay, we received that the night before the competition, so every team went back to their room. They couldn't do any development off-site. They all had to do it right on so that the judges could watch while it was happening. But one thing they could do is go and do some design work. So we all went back to our hotel rooms, and each team started designing their training. Okay, now some had the goal and attitude that they were going to create very, they were going to try to cr convert the entire course. Others said we would like to focus on interactivity. So the first place finishing team was WBT Systems out of Ireland. Now, again, these guys did a great job. I do not want to, I, by the way, I came in on the fourth place team, and so for those of you who have participated in my shootouts, I was on, in the fourth place team, but I loved it. I still learned so much, and I think it was an excellent learning event. Is um, uh, The first place team was WBT Systems out of Ireland, and they converted, okay, now if you had to guess this, this is a tough one, they converted all 54 hours online. But basically what they did, and they, I think, you know, again, they won the competition, so in my eyes they used, the, they used a great approach. They took the lesson plan in its electronic format. They cut out the, uh, the narrative text that exists in the lesson plan. They created a title screen in their e-learning tool. They pasted in the narrative text. They pasted in the questions in their, in their question and assessment editor. And they laid out the, the hierarchy for the whole course, all the lessons and modules and topics. And then they pasted everything in from the, from the organizer. And, and so rapid development occurred. In, in two days, they, con they converted an instructor lesson plan uh, into, uh, for 54 hours of, of typical instructor-led training and put it online. The second place team did the same thing. That was IBM Lotus Learning Space at the time. This was, this was several years ago before many of these rapid tools started to, to exist. Now, the third place team I thought was very interesting, and we all know who they are, Macromedia. Now, Macromedia eventually, uh, you know, now part of Adobe. Now, I really respected and admired what they did, even though, again, they were just ahead of me in the, in the finishing point. Uh, what Macromedia did, well, I didn't tell you the topic. The topic is industrial glass glazing, you know, how you create glass for different types of scenarios. And so, um, you know, it's not really visually stunning or appealing content in the first place, but, um, you know, and in, in sometimes difficult to look for, where do you put interactivity in this area? Well, Macromedia, I, I really respected what they did. They went into one module. You could start anywhere in the lesson plan you wanted. And they didn't tell us that, that the goal was to put all of it online. They just wanted to see what, how, how well we could put this together. 
Well, Macromedia chose a module on bulletproof glass. Okay, so you take a, uh, there was a chart in the, in the lesson manual that showed different thicknesses of bulletproof glass and firing distances. So they created an animation or a, an interactive simulation where you could actually take a gun and move it to different distances and fire it at the glass. Effectively, it was a small test lab. Now, very effective. The, 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 the point was made uh, very much uh, with, through the training. Okay, now I, I'm not, I won't talk about my entry or anybody else at this point, but now do you see the difference? No, I, I didn't tell you how much they created. Of the 54 hours instructor-led course, they replicated approximately 45 minutes of material. Okay, so you see the difference between teams one, two, and three. Very different. And so then we had to take this, these, our, our content in and show it to 20 judges, 100, 150 uh, members of the media gallery. But the fun thing that I got to do was walk around and watch other teams, and I got to see what they did. Now, I think in many ways this story typifies what we face in our organizations, doesn't it? Uh, we're often given a lesson plan and asked to rapidly create content. And what happens is that we either, we either get on one side of the a stick or the other where we're trying to do something very interactive and it takes all of our time and we can't deliver in the rapid mode. Or we default and punt and do what most people do. We basically turn to trying to put as much content online in a very short amount of time as possible. Now, my, my uh, summary on that is, that, you know, there's, there's, something, there's something to, uh, I think, that we all have to consider. And as, as this an animation comes up, you're going to see, I think we're all faced with this continuum of page turning versus highly uh, uh, simulated uh, interaction. Now, Seema, you're online. Can you see that, that timeline, the page turner to simulate? Yes, we can. Okay, for some reason it's not appearing in my preview screen, so I'm hoping that everybody can see this. It's basically a continuum line with page turning on the left and highly simulated uh, interactivity on the right. And I think, again, we all face that, uh, that, that, that challenge. So uh, with that said, um, uh, okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to put this over on this side. All right. Now, so I, I, I pulled some numbers. Because I, I work for a research organization and I had, have worked with Brandon Hall Research for many years, we were able to gather some very interesting numbers. And we, we did this by defining levels of interactivity of a course. Now, I know there's different uh, measurements out there. I know the U.S. government and the military have their levels of interaction. This is slightly different, but, but you know, in, in some ways very similar. Uh, we define level one interactivity, and uh, you'll see that over here on the, in the upper quadrant, uh, level one interactivity as basically page turning with test questions. Okay? We see a lot of that kind of e-learning out there. Uh, it's good for informational purposes. Uh, there are certain levels where, where uh, higher level learning does not take place through level one interactivity. And so, uh, but, but level one tends to be more of the rapid development mode that we see today. So level two is basically level one. It's the, it's, uh, the page turning test questions plus, and I think this is important, 25% interactive exercises, the use of simulations and games. Now, again, think of a hybrid of what we talked about with the PC Week shootout. If we would take those, that first course that was converted directly from the lesson plan and, in, and inside of that, put the bulletproof glass exer uh, uh, exercise of dragging the gun that was created by Macromedia. And you mix those things together up to the level where you have a, a mixture of very good in interactive instruction, uh, interactivity uh, inside, embedded inside the lesson. Well, you know, that's, that's intriguing, but you're going to see in a moment what that does to cost. And then we have level three. Okay, now. The study that I worked on, one of the studies I worked on was we went out and we interviewed, well, not interviewed, we surveyed and collected data from 120 different custom courseware developers. So this is what was published in a, in a report called the Custom Content Developer Report. And we asked how long does it take or how much does it cost? How much would you charge your customer to create content in each of those areas? And you can see here the average cost for developing level one courseware. Now, again, a lot of you are going to find this information very helpful just in internal discussions about what makes rapid development w at work and how does it uh, uh, work well. And level two, 24,000. Now, you're going to see the, the ranges, too. And the ranges are not based on an individual answer. 
uh, this range here for 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 rapid development for ten thousand and ten thousand and nine dollars. How specific is that? Uh, is basically uh, it's the average low range of the organizations. Not just there were there was a single organization that said, "Heck, we do level one for two thousand dollars per finished hour." There's other organizations that were higher than the average, but the low average was ten thousand dollars. The high average was twenty thousand dollars. But you see. All of a sudden, again, the same thing that the Family Feud game tried to, or the Family Feud style game tried to illustrate, is the fact that when we all default to rapid development, we tend to want to be in this in this in this area, thirty to fifty hours to one, and in a cost range that's very affordable when we internally produce the content, and not, uh, you know, usually we're not talking about, oh, we want to do rapid development, therefore we'll pay thirty thousand dollars per finished hour for internal development. At a rate of seven and take seven hundred and fifty hours of one to create. Well, again, you see the, the you see the point I'm trying to make, and I, I'm probably kind of beating this to death a little bit. But I think again, if you get a, uh, we'll, we'll make a copy of these slides available to you through follow up, uh, and also a, we're, we've got a recorded version of this webinar coming out. If you'd like to make this point in case to any of your colleagues, I think any time that rapid developments discuss that these kinds of metrics need to be talked about. So now we're going to turn the corner a bit and talk about how. Okay, so if we know why, I mean we, we know where the barriers are, we acknowledge the problems, we know that we probably would all like much more interactivity in our rapid development, but the question is how. Okay, and I want to this I want to turn to uh, IBM. I think that they have developed a model and some of you some of you have seen me use this. I, I just still I love it. I think it illustrates the point so well. And there's so many levels to it that make it a compelling uh, uh, model that I think we all need to, to learn from this one. And that is um, IBM developed a blended learning model a while back uh, that they use on almost every course that they produce. And they initially uh, set levels of the, of the blend so that uh, they acknowledge the fact that some content is taught in a static mode, things like product knowledge and basic information. Uh, and those things happen in PowerPoint format. I mean, they can be taught in a page-turning mode. So in other words, it's not a, I think what we need to get used to here, it's not a matter of do we develop a level one course or a level two course or a level three course. It's that when we do a curriculum analysis of what we're trying to teach and we look at our instructional objectives, we realize that some things are taught where we need to uh, give them some basic information. And I'm going to talk about the concept of remember and do. Now, I, I kind of uh, borrowed this uh, instructional design methodology from a good friend, Sue Hall. So she's credited with this. But it's a, it, you know, with, there's all kinds of instructional design model, like Gagne's nine events. There's David Merrill with all his uh, uh, you know, different uh, uh, component display theory boxes that you, know, you can talk about different levels. I love Sue Hall's model. Uh, there's a two-tier model of instructional design, and that is remember and do. So when we, when we teach remember, we're out in this zone. We're teaching things that need to, uh, in the outer ring. We're, we're teaching things that need simple, simple, simply to be remembered by the learner. And then when we start to get to application, of course you need to give them opportunities to practice. And again, this is where rapid development really starts to break down because um, uh, you know, because again, we're we're too worried about cost. We're too worried about how much time it will take. Can we really use games? And again, we're going to show some examples of that. And this is something that I tried to reinforce through every hands-on workshop that I taught. And I had the chance to use Raptivity, for example, and 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 use that in the in the workshops. And uh, it was a great opportunity to teach people how to build interactivity. But okay, so let's talk a little bit about what tools people might use in these areas because I, I think that's important. Um, you know, uh, in, in the outer ring, this is where people are using things like, like Articulate, they're using Breeze, they're using, uh, uh, you know, maybe some standard authoring tools, uh, like Tora Publisher, uh, you know, and so, and so those are things, again, that uh, there are lots of tools that do rapid development. And then when you get to this middle ring, there are templates inside a lot of those tools that you can use to build interactivity. But I think the thing that made, makes Raptivity an, an interesting and compelling um, uh, case study, and, and again, I, I was happy when they called me and asked me to do this session because I think it works very well. Okay, so even because they're sponsors, I want to acknowledge there are other tools out there, and we know that, but we're going to use them to illustrate this point. So 
uh, we're going to, uh, in just a moment, we're going to see a quick demonstration. But again, the rapid development tools are here. And they, and so, but what Raptivity did that was so fundamentally different, I think, than everyone else is that um, they approached just the interactivity side and said, okay, what can, what can we do or build as a tool set that would approach that center ring? And, and by the way, Raptivity does have tools that are designed to, to put together the interactivity and sequence and build courses. But what we're going to be talking about today is just a few simple templates and use that through, through illustration. So uh, what we're going to demonstrate for you right now and using Raptiv uh, Raptivity, and I'm, I'm going to talk you through this, but have the folks on the Raptivity side actually create some of these things. Um, okay, let's say that we were creating a, uh, uh, a lesson for, on product knowledge for somebody. So we, we, we basically can use a rapid development tool, create some conceptual material, uh, talk through the first end of the process, but at some point um, we need to, uh, you know, we, we're going to add something like a, a game, uh, maybe to reinforce some terminology or uh, to make sure that they understand what we just taught them, or a scenario-based simulation. So that's where we're going to go with our demonstration next. And, and uh, in, in, my, in my lab sessions that I used to teach, we would create these things in isolation, and by the end of the two days we would start showing how to string these together into a single course. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn uh, the screen sharing over to Seema from Raptivity. And Seema's going to walk us through, and you're going, to, you're going to see our parking lot for just a minute as we transition, but she's going to take over just momentarily here. All right. Okay. So now we're, we, we are in the Rapid uh, Raptivity uh, website for a moment. Now, before you go into this, Seema, I, I, I can see you're excited to jump into the game, but I just want to do, why don't you click on the Overview tab really quickly. Okay, so Raptivity, what they've done, and again, I find this very intriguing, is that they created uh, in, uh, interactive templates for specific learning outcomes and have compartmentalized those into individual buckets. And so, uh, again, the tools I was teaching in my class, I had one tool called Hot Potatoes, for example, from the University of Victoria that you could create crossword puzzles. Now, crossword puzzle is part of the Raptivity pack, so, it's, so again, it's replicated here. But I would show people in the class how to grab a, a, a crossword puzzle from Hot Potatoes and grab a, uh, another branching role play simulation from another vendor and then bring, you know, bring them in in a variety of formats. Well, Raptivity, the folks at Harbinger actually put together the Raptivity pack by, pulling to, uh, by building templates and then organizing them in this method. So the first thing we're going to do is jump in the gaming template. So same as if you uh, click on games, yep, and then go to Jeopardy. Let's do that one. Okay, we all, we're all familiar with Jeopardy-style games, and we know that uh, some of us have built templates, and some of us have used standard authoring tools to build those templates. But uh, what these guys have done is now build a, um, uh, a, a template that's already ready to be populated. Now, again, she's just clicking on, it's a self-driven, self-paced uh, activity uh, where the learner can go in. They're using freeform response for this, grading. You know, it's the feedback, the scoring mechanism, most all taking place. There's timers. Now, the cool thing about this is once the, one of these is created, now stay right here for just a moment, is that um, uh, basically uh, as the, these answers are, are scored, they, can, they're, they score them conformance, so you can actually treat it like a quiz if you want or a self-paced activity. Um, and now she's going to drop into the authoring level to take a look at how that's created. Now, um, okay, so now again, we've, a lot of us have built templates or have used, now, but, but if you think about how long something like that might take in any other context or situation, it would take quite a bit. So um, uh, she's going to drop into the, to the editor now. So she left the website, has gone to the tool itself, and is basically going to jump into uh, where this is built. Now, again, I've, I, I very much appreciate from Raptivity and this is, uh, this, uh, we don't want to make this a totally infomercial for Reptivity. They're sponsoring the session, but I thought, again, it's a great way to show what's possible and that there are, there are things out there for this. So she's going to the properties of this, uh, of this game, and she's simply right here. She can change the question for that we, the one that we just saw, the vit you know, which vitamin is abundant in citrus fruits, which was one of the categories. Notice she can change the scoring for this event and also uh, the question and the answer. Now, Seema, if you could go and, like, you're, you're going to output this now. Okay, you're done. Let's, okay, so we've gone in, edited all the questions, and we're going to publish this out. 
And I think this is the important part, because one of the objectives that I talked about in the, the demonstration uh, or the um, uh, session copy here was how these things are integrated. Okay, now that we're gonna, uh, I'm going to have her pause here for just a moment after she gets to the screen. But this is now a screen where, where she's ready to wrap it up. Okay, now stop right here for just a moment, because this is what's really, really important. I want to talk about integration. All right. Many of you use different models for creating content. Some of you use desktop authoring tools. Others in the group use LCMS. Some of you make independent individual learning activities available from your learning management system. Some of you build them as standalone. They don't, in other words, they, they don't even launch through an LMS, or, nor are they part of, uh, or, or, or are they part of a, 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 a structured course at all. Okay, regardless of how you use that, what's interesting about Reptivity and the way that they've structured their model, and again, uh, through putting these instructional design templates together, is that uh, the content can be published as a single flash file. You can turn on tracking. You can push it out with uh, in different ver uh, levels of SCORM on AICC. And what happens is when, once you're done, if you, if you do click Publish with a tr uh, Tracking, it's going to create the zip file with the manifest with... Uh, the uh, ready to be put into something that can track that in a SCORM in a SCORM method. If you just say I don't want published with tracking, I just want to embed it in my Lectora Publisher application or inside Breeze. Uh, this is you know it, it, the standard output is simply a flash file. So again, uh, and, and and when I demonstrated this in my hands-on labs, again using tools like Hot Potatoes, the output was HTML and JavaScript. But then you could take that and embed that inside of a of an authoring system as well. What I like to look at this is is um, the, one of the reasons we don't do interactivity in our courses is because again those, the family feud thing outlined it very well. It's it's because to create those piece by piece or stick by stick in the standard tools <clears throat> that we typically use to create our training is very difficult. So I I very much admire the approach that was taken by this organization in in building templates that were standalone and can be published directly in or put directly inside that up. Uh, why don't you cancel out of this and go back? To, oh, go back to the menu there. Okay, just really quick, we'll just take a look at one other game. I mean, you can see the formats are are very similar, but just do like Wheel of Fortune or something. Yeah. But as you look at the screen, some interesting things, slot machines, so you can uh, bet, wager on your ability to answer a question and then pull a slot machine handle and see if you how you do. Go ahead and spin that. All right, but notice the categories. So here you can have categories of questions. It will actually draw and pull from a pool of questions. And so there we go. We've got sports as a category. All right, that, I think that's enough of the game side. Let's Now let's go to something a little more complex. Okay, now... Because uh, you know, I, I even I was teaching the session once, and I had somebody from Microsoft, I believe it was. She was sitting in the back of the room, and she said, "Do games really teach?" And the rest of the audience went, "Ooh, you know, they they because they knew that, <laughs> that when they effectively use games, they're a great uh, motivational and reinforcing effort." But some people still maybe don't want to use games. But let's talk about simulations. Go to simulations if you would. Okay, now this is I to me. This is something that everyone should be using. There, there's a few simple interactions that everyone should be using in their in their development. One, and I, before you jump into the simulation here, some are things like discrimination exercises. Uh, discrimination exercise meaning classifying something. You know, taking a list of items and saying, is this this type or that type? You should be using that everywhere. Another one is adaptive scenarios. If you think about it, you set a simple. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead and open up adaptive scenario. If you think about it. You know, you set a scenario, a situation of something you're trying to teach, and then you want them to make decisions, but there's one really more, very much more important aspect to using branching scenarios, and that is you want to give your learners the opportunity to make mistakes and fail. Often in our rapid development, we just give, we push information at them, hope it's stuck, and we have no, except for maybe a few test questions, we really have no idea that are based on facts and, and concepts. We have no idea about how they're going to perform. Simple, simple branching role play scenarios is, is really a great ticket. So in this case, this is a, a salesperson, and he works for a car dealership. And basically, the, the instructional designer who created this has figured out, I'm going to... Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to give him. Uh, I'm going to build some good options and some, some maybe some less to some a lesser degree, some other options that this person can make. 
So go, go ahead and choose the right answer. I think you do you know what the right answer is. Oh, hey, you got it wrong. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe you don't know what the right answer is on this one. I think it was just, hi, I'm Richard. May I help you? I think it was just the third one down. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, that's correct. So, he, you know, just a, a nice, polite greeting, but now make a wrong answer. Okay, but the, what's happening in the branching scenario? Okay, she's asking, which car are you driving now? Well, guess what? Uh, the customer doesn't have a car. We didn't know that, and so it's kind of an offensive question. So, uh, you know, maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. Now, again, instructionally, you can do anything you want with this, but think about the power of teaching by making mistakes. And it's not just a simple multiple choice question, but it's something that can be laid out relatively easy, and it gives you feedback. But notice something else that's happening in this in this example of a simulation. If, if you think about it, you know, and we can all create branching role plays with HTML, with other tools. I mean, this is easy. You basically set up your first screen. You, on the first screen, you put some choices, and then from those choices, it leads to the natural consequence. From those consequences, there's more choices. They lead to more. But you know what happens? Even if you give them three or four choices on the first screen, three or four on each of the sub-choices, three or four on the sub-sub-subs, pretty soon you're branching out into a, a huge fan that's unmanageable. Well, I want to drop into the authoring environment of this simulation, if I could, because I think this is, to me, and by the way, I tried to create this, this template, this very template, in 1994, and I failed. So I was really ex excited to see, and this is one of the examples I like to use for my activity. Now, oh, before you go into that, hang on for just a second. Uh, I, I wanted to, oh, you're, you're going to write to the right spot. Notice everybody over on the left, uh, one thing that these guys have done, they, they have over 200 templates uh, you know, in their activity, and they've organized them by different instructional models. Bloom's Taxonomy, Gagne's Nine Events of Instruction. Go ahead and click on, on Gagne. Oh, yeah, Bloom's, that's good. Okay, so there's templates organized by knowledge, comprehension, application. Uh, Gagne, we're going to see the, the uh, uh, gaining attention and the right time to provide feedback and, and provide learner guidance. An arc, so you don't need to click on them all. But you notice, I, again, uh, have, as the creator of Designer's Edge back in the 90s, this to me is very intriguing because it has, uh, it, 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 it reinforces the concept that we are, we are building instructional materials. Now, let's go into that uh, branching role play uh, uh, template that we were looking at. And now remember this, again, I learned by, by failure, I, I failed at creating this kind of a scenario because I, I don't think I had the uh, right engineering uh, effort and, and I, concept in mind. My, our templates were, were pretty much restricted to screen layout templates and some very simple basic gaming. But okay, so now let's see. Here we go. All right, it's coming up here. Now, stop right here for just a second, Seema, if you would. What we're looking at is the actual interaction the way that the learner sees it. Only there's one extra button now called schematic view. And the schematic, go ahead and click on schematic view. I think you're going to immediately see the power of this. Okay. So what happens is it creates a mini flow chart of the choices that are made, showing the right path, where, what leads to the final decision. And so you build them based scene upon scene that can be linked together so that the branching role play occurs. Now, the model here is you could go out and create a very bra uh, fanned out branching tree that goes to 100 different choices but they have ways of bringing them back and taking them back into making that choice again and, and, and reinforcing that before they move on to the next step. So let's just say that on the second tier there's a question. Go ahead and click one of those blue boxes. Okay, here was a choice that was one of the Richard made that, was, that would be wrong, that the learner would make that would be wrong in the scenario. So remember the feedback was pretty simple. I thought it was a little simplistic. It said that might not be so. But let's say you wanted to really teach through that second level choice if you notice in the remedial feedback box, it, it says that might be so. You could actually change that text, tell them exactly why that's wrong, give them some more information about uh, uh, what they should have done. So again, um, you know, th uh, these are things that I think for a novice developer sometimes can be very complex. But I think if made simple through some simple template-based input, uh, input, that that uh, the interactivity can be achieved. So let, we're going to drop out of this now. Uh, and, and go back to the presentation. I, I, I really appreciate, again, the illustration that we, that we saw here. Let's see. I'm going to take control again. All right. It's not letting me change my back to the presenter here. One moment. Okay. 
there we go. For some reason it wasn't letting me take control there. <laughs> All right, so now you should see my screen coming up in just a moment. I just wanted to make the point then, let me go ahead and share my screen, that um, uh, as we look at the IBM model again, uh, we haven't talked about how to build the, the, uh, the standard part or the informational part of the rapid development. And again, there are many tools out there for this purpose. And there are, so, you know, and, and I think we find less in this particular camp of things that you can create exercises and practice. But I would uh, strongly encourage you to really take a look at how you fit that into your model. And you don't need, uh, one thing that is, it probably is going to require is multiple tool sets. And that really changes the dynamic for some. But I think, uh, you know, again, looking at cost, you need to keep the uh, uh, content uh, in that, uh, I mean, that's, something that you have to keep in line and know what you're going to do. Um, one of the instructional methodologies listed inside of the Raptivity was Bloom's Taxonomy. And again, if you look at that three-ring concentric circle from IBM, uh, again, they, I think that it's exactly the way that the three rings map. Knowledge and comprehension exists on that outer ring where rapid development tools and information sharing works fine. So one thing I'm here to tell you is that, pay, okay, I'm going to say it. Uh, because some people won't. Page turning is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing if used in moderation at the right time, matching learning objectives in the right way. But I think, again, where we most fail is teaching application and, and t t teaching people how to classify, arrange, organize, explain. You know, these, again, you look at the verbiage for Bloom's taxonomy. This is higher level learning, higher level thinking and skills and down on through the, the rest. And I would say that some of, again, I, w I don't want to discount the power of building very robust simulations beyond what Raptivity can do. You know, you can build holistic business simulations of making decisions and running a, biz a mock business for years and years. But again, those things can be even used a little bit more sparingly and your budget spent well in applying those in the right area. Because if you built their whole course in a very, very interactive mode, you'd also be in trouble. So I think uh, uh, one thing that we're all trying to achieve here is balance. And that goes back to the, the whole concept, and I won't uh, to talk, uh, try to talk about this too much because we've already talked about it, but the concept of remember and do and just re realize that rapid development uh, really uh, is about, uh, you know, if we, if we can teach the remember through rapid development, spend a little bit more time but not uh, too much on, uh, you know, in, in building building opportunities to try and practice and to do. So uh, let's see. And, uh, what, okay, this, uh, we're, we're a couple slides away from the end here, and we'll have op open for question and answer. But I did want to talk about this. I think it's real important. Okay, we've got the ADDIE model represented through the blocks in the center, analyze, design, develop, implement, evaluate. Now, um, one thing that I think is, is critically important is sometimes we don't start really planning our levels of interactivity until we hit the development stage, and that's way too late in the process. And so I think what you know, what uh, uh, and so, you know, some of you go, well, that's that's dumb. We we plan it very much very early. I think what has to happen is right up front in the design is when it needs to take place. But I, I'll tell you, I've been inside organizations that don't do it that way. They'll design by laying out the, doing a curriculum analysis and, and making some general assumptions about uh, what modules they'll be covered in, but they wait until a little bit later, maybe even in storyboarding perhaps. But most often uh, they'll say, oh, hey, I've got a cool new way to do this, so they'll wait till the authoring stage or even the prototype stage to develop for the first time. Well, in many ways that's way too late. But you know, uh, I'll give you a tip, uh, and, and I know a lot of courseware development shops that do this. And I think it's spectacular, and so I'm going to share it with you today because I think it, it really represents the best practice. And that is, uh, well, two things. One, what I would recommend, highly recommend, is that you have a sampling, a sampler. Okay, now you saw when Seema opened up, the reason I had her show that very first page, showing a number of templates and organized in, in, very, in a very nice organized way, uh, she had um, uh, organizational templates that showed when to use different design templates. But think about if you had that in your organization uh, as a menu, a whole menu of interactions that you could uh, show to your design team. And, and some of you develop for customers, whether internal or external. Well, actually, we all develop for customers if we look at it that way. 
But what if you had for them an interactivity menu? You could use this for pricing purposes. You could use it, you know, you could say, hey, we need to develop a little bit more interactivity. We, you know, let's say you want a role play simulation as part of your course. Or you need to do something, you know, let's do some interactive flashcards. Uh, again, one of the best practices I've seen is organizations that have this almost like in a carpet book sampler. You know, your, your carpet supplier comes in, opens up the sampler, and says, well, which carpet would you like? Well, what if you could do that when, you're, when you are approaching an instructional project and say, you know, you could sit with the design team, look through the interactive strategies that you are, already have. Now, if you already know which ones that are easy to develop for rapid development, you can put those first, and you can build upon your portfolio over time. You can start to build up a, a really robust portfolio. Now, again, this is as commercial as I'm going to get. If your activity, are, to me, already has some, a, a good chunk of that portfolio ready for you. Uh, but, there, again, I think there's things that we've developed in-house that we can add to that and build up our portfolio so that it has many interactive types and becomes a, a great best practice. Um, and now I, I did want to, uh, we're going to do one more quick uh, Raptivity demo, if that's okay with you. I would like to, I'm going to turn the screen over to Seema now, and, and we're just going to do something very quick, a, a labeling exercise. Now, okay, labeling is a very powerful, uh, 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 it's a very powerful uh, teaching tool. Uh, and I, I'd say discrimination exercises and labeling are two of, of, the, of the best because you can teach something very quickly that way. So I'll go ahead and click on labeling. I, I included a screenshot of this one in my presentation, but it's actually labeling the parts of a microscope. Okay, and let's see. Let's pull it up there. Okay, now, now again, so we've seen this. Kasima, go ahead and you can fill it in, but we've seen this. Click and drag exercise. Okay, many authoring tools have this. They absolutely do. And, um, and you can, you know, uh, pull us in, and, and I think this is something that's becoming templ more templatized in some authoring tools, but not in others. But I want to show you something fun interesting that she has here. Look at her template. She's now going to click Correct Answer, and notice how it will sort the answers. So you can actually see your answer versus the correct answer. Now let's say that you use the template that came with your authoring tool, and you wanted to add that level of functionality. What would that take? You know, again, that would take quite a bit to go through and, Reauthor the template and reapply it so that uh, you had that level of feedback. Let's drop into the, uh, the, uh, the editing mode. Now, again, remember people use these things in different ways. Now, before you before you do this, Seema, let, let me let me talk just a second here. Um, remember, some of you may, are using desktop tools to create authoring. Others are using LCMS. Others want to embed it inside of other rapid tools like Articulate, Breeze. Uh, Lector Publisher, other types of tools used for rapid development, ReadyGo. Uh, there are many uh, authoring uh, environments, structured environments out there. One, one comment I would make is I think in best practices of doing rapid development is don't ever, you don't really need, uh, use some, don't build navigation at the page level. If you're, if you're doing that, I think that's something that you should probably, I think the world has moved beyond that. We used to do that back in the 90s. It doesn't really... Help, you know, putting the next button on every page, hoping that the next button links to where it's supposed to link. I think we, we're, we're moving to a place of, of perpetual controls. So in this case, let's say that the labeling exercise here, we wanted to put it into an LCMS. Now go into the, the interface there. Let's find the labeling exercise. And um, let's say that we're going to put it in an LCMS. So the idea is to come into a tool like Raptivity. Again, it's designed for, for these quick best practice uh, type of interactions. Let's create a new a new touch area here. Okay, there's the new touch area. It's number six. Now, again, I've done this with Dreamweaver Course Builder templates. Works, it works well. So, the, you know, the same principle applies. I just we wanted to show you how this one works. So she changed the uh, the value to lens. Okay, it's done. She's already finished it because the template is designed for text-based labels. It's already done. So now preview that. Now, in this particular example, the boxes were part of the graphic. But, but notice, uh, lens, if you grab, grab lens, you don't have to label them all. Just Okay, the area is there. Basically, you need to change the graphics so that it has an actual touch area. But that's it. It's all scored, ready to go. All right, again, quick example. Now we're almost done and ready for questions. I'm going to take back control. And we'll finish up here. So here's my final tips. Tips and suggestions for using interactivity in instructional development. One is um, you know is to use that idea of the creativity sampler. 
you know, we've talked about most of these, so I'm just reinforcing that here. The interactive sampler is part of design. Use it before design takes place, not after. Don't think of the interactivity as an afterthought. Don't create navigational controls at the page level. It's a waste of time. And then also, I, I said this, page turning isn't bad. It's moderation. That's the important thing. And then I didn't talk about this one, but I think it's important. When you create your prototype for your course, what it inst uh, some people will pick a lesson or a module to prototype. I think that's uh, not the best approach. And I'll just uh, I'll give you what I think is a better model. And that is if you're creating a course, you should prototype every level of interaction. So in other words, we don't need to see pages and pages of, of text. What we want to see is this is how text will be displayed. Here's text with a graphic. Here's an interact. Here's a labeling exercise. Here's and so you, you you prototype for rapid development based on interaction, not on on a, a, a small piece of content. You are going to probably use multiple tools if you use this model, but I but I tell you it's going to be cost effective in the long run. And then um, you know one thing I would say is that we talked a lot about interactivity, and it's really easy to focus on that through this session because the topic is on interactivity. But don't make it don't let it overshadow the instruction. Do not use interactivity for interactivity's sake. Uh, the most important thing is that you use it for learning purposes. Now, we've addressed the issues I had, I believe, through the Family Feud game. We've talked about cost. Uh, we talked about too much. Well, we haven't talked about cost too much. Uh, uh, somebody may ask that question during the Q&A session. But uh, taking too much time, uh, you know, we don't want to take too much time. We, each of these issues, ha can we integrate it? Yes. Uh, it's not in PowerPoint. So what? We can create it outside and pull it in if we need to. Uh, with that further ado, then, uh, let's go to the question and answer session. And we're going to wrap up here in just a moment. So I'm going to click, let's see, questions. I don't have my question pod open. I need to open that really quickly. And let's see which ones. There are lots of questions in there. We'll, get, we'll pick up a few. Now, oh, by the way, we're going to close this session in about three minutes because we started a little bit after the hour. But uh, at that point, we will stay online and answer questions in text-based mode. But in order to receive the answers, you probably need to stay online because um, these are um, things that we can, uh, uh, you know, that we can uh, uh, take a look at. So uh, let's see. Uh, Seema, you haven't talked yet, so let's give you a question. It says, when using re reactivity, do you still need a graphic artist? Um, when you use Raptivity, you would need graphic images, that's for sure. If you have graphic artists, that would be great, so you can customize your graphics. Yes. Okay. By the way, you did a great job with the demonstration. Oh, thank <laughs> you, Brian. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Looking for questions here. Okay. Does Raptivity address psychomotor and affective domains in addition to cognitive domains shown today? Now, um, I, I'll let uh, Seema see if she would like to take that one on, too. That's a, uh, I, I would say this. Uh, psycho, uh, when, when I see, see the uh, phrase psychomotor, I've always considered that part of blended learning where you actually are things that people do on the job. Like if you're teaching someone a mechanical engineering task or, or you know, they still need to use that wrench to, uh, uh, to, you know, and how much torque they need to remove a, a panel or something, that psychomotor skills are almost always not taught through e-learning. On the affective domain, we're mostly talking about motivation. And you can add motivation by using things like on-screen characters and um, uh, avatars, folks that introduce them to the topic, themes, and lead them through and keep motivation levels high. I would say my, my answer would be something to this effect, that those are the, that's the glue that holds the interaction activity together. So that becomes the primary body of your instruction uh, from the affective side, and then you bring in the right levels of interaction at the right time. And so I, I don't think, I think affective has to be tied to the person's personal job experience and their background. So I think you could probably use some of the templates for that purpose, but that becomes the domain of the instructional design expert. I hope that answers the question well. Let's see, I think we have time for one more question. Sorry that we're going to cut that brief, but we will be around to answer questions in text-based mode. Let's see if we've got some right here. Pull up one more question. Okay. A lot of them are about reactivity, so. And uh, okay, well that, that's one. Let's just let's finish with that one. How much does reactivity cost? We talked about cost in the, as an issue. Uh, why don't we go ahead and answer that? Looks like there are several questions in that area. Oh, Brian, I can answer that. Please. Um, 
cost is a, a Raptivity basic license cost is $750 and all the packages that you saw, all the packages that were displayed on the screen are add-on packages and they vary from um, about $300 to $500 um, and you get to select which package you, you want to use. Okay, very good. Well, hey, again, uh, po apologize that we had to cut question and answer short, but we will stay online, so if, uh, uh, we will officially end the audio portion of the session. We want to thank you for being here today. And if you, again, if you have any questions, there's contact information on the screen. If you'd like to uh, contact uh, SEMA with uh, questions about Raptivity or myself with questions about uh, the, the presentation. Now, along, along with that, we will be sending out, um, or, or the Raptivity will be sending out uh, links to the recorded version of the session, as well as uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll make the uh, copies of the PowerPoint slides available, because that was another question many folks had. Thank you for joining today, and we're going to close the, set, the audio portion of the set, session, and we'll answer questions online. Thank Definitely. You. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.
them for that help. And even though I knew I couldn't do it, I didn't want to do it. I don't want to speak of the different topics that come up. Most of the work that I did in Florida was about the insurance and the work that the police that they do to make sure that that it's not done. So I'm not going to speak of those too much.
Hi, Shannon. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Yeah, we got home late, 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 late. See, we're actually late in the morning, but yeah, we're home. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, you're on the calendar. Yeah, you're on the calendar. No, no, no. Let me check with Jimmy Lynn. Let me look for the piece of paper for this one. Oh, Shannon, did you make it in? Did you send the package? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, we're set. No problem. Just send it. I have it here. Okay, see you soon, Shannon. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.
Well, good. He's going to do that with me. Oh, well, they can't get rid of the bus now, so I would rather be doing it with him. Okay, so what I think for the next video, we're going to go to Life Special Adventures All Skills. Cinderella for But there's no limitation to it, so it's just like the next day we're going to do the other one. Okay. <laughs> that would be easier. So let's see if we can make it look better. Okay. So we like to see the four ninety nine each. Yes. That would be one for Okay, and let's try and get Life Special Star. Mm -hmm. That's one more. Why? Everybody has yeah. this thing. Let's go on this one. Oh, I can't find it. I hope Brian doesn't like it. <laughs> What's why the look of it? Oh, thank you, Brian. Why did you say three days in a row? Four days in a row. Four is good. Thank you. Four and one day good. Let's try and see if we have enough for two days. <laughs> okay, my show's gone. My show's gone. Yours good. is gone because I don't know what you need to tell me. I need to put my show's on lock. Show, my show needs to be on lock. Great show. Jimmy left it. Thank you, Star. Let me go down. How about Ty? Oh, Ty is on here. Okay, so let me go to my debacle. One is on here. Ty is on here. He's all yellow.
qualified person from the edit to develop this question in this way. So everybody is looking at questions for that edit because they're also interested in other requirements. So it's not just the question that they're looking at. So what I should say there is is that there are other questions for other questions. Said you can't say that one license per user or one license. Which one? Which two tablets are you talking about? Because how did you get a copy of the presentation? You can probably download one from the library. Okay. And suppose it's in software edit and they don't want to get it. Okay, now how do I do this? Okay, okay. now how do I do this? So what if you want to pay? What if you want to pay for the user at all? Because I'm the only one having so many problems. Actually, no, this is red. <laughs> Why? Good morning, user or training. Good morning, user three four four. Look at the call for it. So there is a question. Yeah. You got this. This is actually one of my favorite questions. Oh, thank you all. Can you add add the ad added added to your screen? So wait a minute. Let me make sure it's not added to my screen. So the first one. What is there of three turbo pack <laughs> in that? So now you can add the ad on your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a lot easier than the other one. Why would it be? Oh, they are. You don't see them anymore, three turbo pack. So now how do I do this? No, no, see the ad. So there are little ones. So you can either play with them by clicking on them or you can click on them and then you can see the little ones. So you can see the three little things on the screen. They are good users. All these other types of questions. Does that explain that you can click from click to a little I wonder if somebody promised for three turbo packs. Yeah, three turbo packs. See there's two other ones in there too. But see there's two turbo packs in there. So you have like seven of that for the three turbo packs. So it's very simple and it's very easy to add and add and add. But see the question is what if you want to pay for the three turbo packs? Yeah. You got it, but you're not the end. I said, and uh, how's your mind there? My mind is already there. Get it? Get it?
Not that I have come to the discussion. That is so pathetic. I mean, not that what happened in his language and his family and his life was so tragic. Oh, it just had to be a virgin family. Especially for this one. And this is the two daughters. I can't imagine the mental upside of that lady. Did you know what makes me think of Fast Five with her brother? Oh, yeah. Bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. And then she gave one birth alive. Yeah. It's just like two men and then another couple. Four Jewish psychologists and one murdered and one murdered. So I was actually exactly what is doing north of um, Des Moines. Yeah. And then the flight never um, yeah. reached our daughter coming back here. So I looked at the thing and said, one and done, and I was there like six, 12 hours to just get to the Des Moines. Right. And there was um, a Kenyan Kenyan And there was a lot about Jerry Kantai because it was kind of a light at that time in Southern California. Yeah. It was close to seven to eight hours for the drive, I think, to Des Moines. Then we go to the town and come back. And then they brought a plane like around the next morning to come pick us. They're going to give you five dollars. Five dollars to one. And they could have, they asked me if you want to dance. The moment all this happened, I was like the most nervous I've ever been. Like, in about half an hour, I got a call on my cell phone from United Airlines. Because they thought I had missed the flight, right? I was booked on next day after my flight had took early that gets to Des Moines at 6 or 4 or something. And no one could go out to find me. So I don't know. But I saw that there was a flight. And we were like 15, 20 minutes away. And I feel like, what do other people know? That we were supposed to come here. But it was bad. So there was nothing I could do. So how did you? Then I... Yeah, I was sick of the 